for our COBT friends, it's Maynard, Mike, and Brett. Here was something really exciting to kick off the fall. We've got our good friend, Jeff Merrifield with us. He's a partner at Pillsbury. He's head of global energy for them. And his background and involvement with the nuclear industry is, is extensive. And we're going to be able to talk to him about a whole range of issues. Um, Jeff is the vice chairman of the Nuclear Industry Council. He's the chairman of the Advanced Nuclear Task Force. He's a former member of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He's involved with a number of businesses. He is a nuclear proponent, um, a nuclear um, expert, a lawyer, someone who's worked on transactions. And certainly he's joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. today, which is a testament to his involvement on the government side. Jeff, we're delighted to have you. We couldn't think of a better person to talk nuclear and to kick off the fall with. Well, Maynard, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to a great conversation today. Well, it's going to be awesome. We, uh, we uh, as uh, hope everybody had a great Labor Day weekend, uh, all of us at Veritin, we've gone in a number of directions here to, to kick off the fall. Uh, Mike Bradley is up at Barclays, which, as we all know, is the conference that tends to kick off uh, the, uh, you know, the remainder of the year. Um, Brett's in Charlotte, and a number of us are up in Canada. So we will talk a little bit about Canada and nuclear and everything else. But welcome, Jeff. Mike, can't wait to hear it. Uh, Brett, uh, thank you, uh, as always, for your nuclear excitement. So, Mike, why don't we kick it off? Tell us what's going on up there. Yeah, like you said, uh, Maynard, uh, we are at the Barclays um, Energy and Power Conference. You know, I can make got to designate that power is here as well. And so, you know, it's it's been a really good backdrop. I mean, you know, typically we talk about economics, commodities, broader markets and energy equities. And today we're just going to really focus on commodities, this sort of broader markets, what's going on there in, in energy equities. I mean, so first of all, on commodity side, obviously, we've had crude move up about a dollar today. Brent actually, you know, went above ninety dollars today. And so Brent has moved up around eight, nine, ten percent here over the last five or six days. So has WTI. And so that's fantastic. And one of the reasons why it moved today is uh, Sally came out and said that they were going to extend their million barrel a day, you know, production cuts through year end. They were only saying through October. So year end was uh, was was good. And Russia also said they were going to participate as well. And so we had that backdrop today. And so that was good. I'd say time spreads, you've also seen, as we've talked about this for a long time, time spreads are at one-year highs right now. And so what it's telling you is the market is physically tight. And it's physically tight uh, because of those cuts. And, and, and right now, most people would tell you the markets are going to be about two to maybe even two and a half million barrels per day undersupplied in the second half of this year. Remember, we've been talking about the last, say, three months or so about the markets being concerned with demand. Well, the markets now are getting concerned with supply. OPEC is balancing the market and OPEC's following a, a pricing versus volume strategy. So that's point number one. I'd say from an energy equity standpoint, obviously we're at the Barclays Energy and Power Conference today. And I'd say people are constructive. Now, we had this uh, conference three weeks ago. Maybe not so much, but yeah, people are constructive because crude oil prices uh, are, you know, mid 80s, $90 uh, per barrel. And so the one thing I would say with that, though, is that just look at the last five days. You've had, like I said, Brent move up nine to ten percent, but the equities only move up anywhere from three, four, five percent. So, I think you know investors are still not buying into this move yet. They don't. They're not buying into ninety dollar crude, and so uh, they're generally lagging. But like I said, we're at the conference and people are constructive. You know, so that's interesting. The other thing I'd say is here over the last two, three, four, five weeks. It feels like management teams are more constructive than investors. We're seeing deals. We're seeing deals on the EMP side, midstream side. We just saw a deal after the close. With Dominion announced a deal for around $14 billion, $9 billion in cash flow. So that is a really big deal. And so it's uh, there's a lot of activity going on. So it seems like management teams are more constructive than investors at this point in time. But I think investors will come along. And so that's you know one last thing I'd really you know want to hit on this week. And we're starting to hear you know, this at the conference is um, just this energy transition, how people are looking at it. And the one thing that really stuck out to me last week was Orsted. Orsted is one of the premier offshore wind companies. And they basically announced last week they might have to take a two and a half billion dollar impairment. They haven't taken that yet. And the reason why is for a couple of things. These guys and others have signed these PPAs at pretty low prices. And now with, you know, construction costs moving up, 
you know, costs for electricity going up and, you know, investment tax credits are not getting as much as they want in inflation and now interest rates. You're seeing these guys want to go back and renegotiate these PPAs. And right now, you know, they're trying to use that leverage to say, if we do not get uh, what we want. We're just going to walk away uh, from these PPAs. And so that's something to watch uh, for. I mean, like I said, Orsted's not the only one, and I'm not picking on him, but what it says is that energy transition is not easy. There's a lot of variables going to go into it. It seemed fantastic two years ago, but if you look at the ICLN uh, uh, ETF, it's underperformed. It's down about 20% this year while everything is up. And so it's something we're keeping a close eye on. Uh, and so with that, we'll hand that back to you, Mayor. All right. Well, awesome, Mike. Brett, what would you throw in before we talk to Jeff today? Well, you know, certainly on a on a nuclear related day, I, you know, there's some topics that I think we've been tracking and are interested in recently. You know, our friends at Oaklo, who uh, for everyone's benefit, you know, are kind of uh, planning a deployment of micro reactor technology at INL for a first deployment, and have recently announced second and third reactors in I O in Ohio. Excuse me, uh, through the Southern Ohio Diversification and initiative actually recently were just announced as a winners through an Air Force down selection process to begin contracting to supply a micro reactor at an Alaskan Air Force base through a power purchase agreement. So very interesting new development kind of around selection that we've been waiting for around this project, um, showing more process progress and more engagement from multiple different sort of uh, facets and, and angles of the U.S. government around the nuclear energy and future en nuclear energy topic. And then looking more broadly in kind of a, and internationally, in kind of an, an, an analogy or, you know, a, a similar metaphor to what's going on in the United States at Vogel, where we've seen the AP-1000s, the indigenously designed, you know, U.S. large reactors come online. We just saw t recently this week India come online with their first indigenously designed uh, nuclear reactors, the pressurized heavy water reactors where they're building two at a site with the first one having come online recently but reaching full capacity this week. So it's really kind of a interesting story and kind of different paradigm to look at where these two reactors and projects, excuse me, two power plant projects are happening in different uh, countries. There are two reactors each, but in the U.S. they might be the end. And in India, with this reactor reaching full power, the government announced uh, that they're continuing their plans for gigawatts tens to tw 15 more additional gigawatts of new nuclear in the next 10 years. So the plans in India, very different from the United States, sort of despite sort of the same sort of place right now and challenges and a very sort of different kind of um, discussion taking place there, but interesting nonetheless. No, that's great, Brett. And I think that's that's a really good place, I think, to start, uh, Jeff. Maybe we can change that, uh, get the U.S. back on the on the building trajectory. But thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. Um, maybe as we start, do you mind just telling us a little bit about your vantage point as the head of energy there at Pillsbury? You obviously have so much experience around nuclear and have seen so many things and continue to see a lot of things. But what else at Pillsbury? Uh, give us just a sense of the platform. Um, and the perspective that you have as the head of the energy group. Yeah, our, our roots in energy actually go back to the 1890s. So we were the law firm, the Pillsbury part, coming out of California, that incorporated Standard Oil of, of California, ultimately uh, now Chevron. So our roots go back in the oil and gas industry very deeply. Um, we have the oldest nuclear law practice in the world. We've been around for uh, over 60 years. Uh, more recently, we have joined uh, that to we have a fusion practice. We were the first major law firm to establish a fusion practice, the first major law firm to establish a, a hydrogen focused practice. Uh, and we've got a group of folks, uh, particularly based out of our West Coast offices in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, who work uh, a number of deals on renewables, both wind and solar. So we really 
uh, we're really at a point where we're, we cover the full uh, energy and electricity um, phalanx, and and we represent companies, utilities, advanced reactor developers, technology uh, innovators, and and folks who are supplying the parts and pieces to make all that work. So it's an exciting time. You know, I was thinking about it a little bit, Jeff, in the in the lead in uh, from Mike. There have been over the last few weeks. There's been a handful of transactions: people buying. Uh, oil and gas assets in the Permian, people buying midstream assets, people selling uh, renewable portfolios, uh, this big Dominion uh, Inbridge deal that Mike also mentioned selling uh, gas plants. There's just a lot of stuff moving around as people kind of decide strategically what they want to own and what they're best at and what the best story for them is. Nuclear, um, I think what we what we all wonder about nuclear is um, sometimes it seems like everybody's talking about it, but it's not really yet happening. Other times it looks like things are starting to happen. What would you tell us about the pace of nuclear investment, nuclear activity, like how you feel it's moving? Um, because presumably it's probably moving a lot faster than most of us appreciate. Well, it's, it's sort of, the analogy is sort of like the, the duck floating on the water, but its legs are moving really quickly. And I think I think there's more of that going on in the nuclear industry, and, and I would include the fusion uh, industry as well in that regard. You know, I, I look at it from a historic perspective because we, we did get a lot of, you know, we, we learned a lot. We had a, what we thought was a renaissance back in the early 2000s, and, and obviously the shale revolution, you know, changed that, uh, at least for the, for the time being. I, I would say, you know, we participated in helping Westinghouse, or I should say helping Brookfield, um, purchase Westinghouse. And to me, that was a real bellwether. I mean, you, here you have, you know, one of the largest uh, firms of its type. You know, I think at the time they had uh, probably $600, million, uh, $600 billion plus assets, you know, making a play on, on what was then perceived to be uh, a nuclear technology that was moving forward. And that and that has played, I think, very well for Brookfield. They subsequently uh, sold it to a different part, uh, Brookfield Renewable uh, Assets. But nonetheless stays in the family. But what we've seen more recently, I think, is a lot of interest in industrial companies, both inside and outside of the United States, in terms of putting their toe in the water of, of nuclear. Um, we've had probably a half dozen deals that we've done over the course of the last 18 months. Some of that is driven by companies outside of the United States that want to be suppliers, um, want to be key uh, allies of, of these plants and, and technologies that are moving forward. I think the uh, the Doosan uh, New Scale deal was announced is, is is a good example of that, and there are others um, that I'm aware of out there. Similarly, um, you know, I've I've had the occasion um, to go with industrial clients to go talk to some folks in in the fusion industry and 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 who are thinking about the potential for making investments in in those very exciting technologies as well. So I think the the level of interest is is certainly. Um, increasing, and I think there are some some industries that are looking at nuclear and looking at fusion in a way that you really wouldn't have seen five years ago. Now, that's that's mirrored by the fact, you know, five ten years ago, when we talk about nuclear, typically we would only talk to utilities, right? They were the major users, and I think that dynamic has has really changed. Um, the level of interest in, interest in in some of the smaller um, municipal utilities and, and others, I think, is increasing. Um, there's been a number of announcements about, you know, other industries investing in nuclear technologies because they they, they have to decarbonize Dow. Uh, they're they're a uh, deal with X Energy. Uh, you've got um, you know Nucor that announced a, a deal with with uh, New Scale. I mean, so I think we're seeing more and more of that of of some of these industrial users. Who are looking at these technologies and are figuring out how best to play uh, play in that in that space? So, th- there's a lot of a lot of moving parts and pieces, but an exciting time to be involved in the industry. So, maybe one question for you, Jeff, as you think about the flavors of nuclear right now, and I and I, and I will uh, I'll probably botch this, and you'll give me a better way to think about it. But we've got classic, you know, big nuclear, um, uh, like uh, the Southern Company just brought on. And like Brett mentioned, in India just came on. And then we've got <clears throat> SMRs, sort of slightly smaller, you know, the, the X Energy Dow, the, that type of flavor. 
Um, and then I think in Houston, in, in uh, Texas, we'd call that the F-150 instead of the F-250, because you've got this slightly smaller, but still big nuclear. And then you've got micro, and then you have fission, or fusion rather. Yeah. And so you kind of have four big lanes. If those lanes are the right way to talk about it, where would you say which lanes have the most activity or the most potential to impact all this sooner? Or how do you think about, you know, Pillsbury's own activity in those lanes? Yeah, I might, I might actually subdivide it into, in, in yeah. maybe one more lane, but I'd start first with the, with the large traditional reactors um, in the Westing SAP 1000s are a good example of that. The French have their EPRs, the Koreans have the Korean standard plan and, and, and others. And I think we're going to see a, a continued interest of those in the international market, um, particularly for countries that need, you know, lots of, of, of bulk power. I think the uh, Middle East, North Africa is, is certainly an area uh, we've seen with Westinghouse announcements relative to Poland, uh, Ukraine. There are other Eastern European countries that are, that are looking uh, at that technology and others. So I think there is, there remains a viable market for for those designs and that's not to say there may be a US utility at some point that may want to add uh some additional generation in that range I don't, I don't think you can discount it I think it's probably not as likely uh as as other options but I think it's certainly out there as well the the second lane I would talk about would be the small modular reactors of the light water version you know these are the designs that are similar uh, in, in design to the, the larger re- fleet that we have today in the U.S., but um, are, are smaller. So that would be uh, a company like New Scale, um, Holtec, uh, Westinghouse has a new EP with 300 design that they put out, and that's that's getting some attention. Uh, GE with the BWRX 300, and, that, and that's gotten probably the most attention because of the deals that they've signed with Ontario Power Generation uh, at the Darlington site and then TVA with the Clinch River site. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then finally I would round that out with Rolls Royce that has a design that will be deployed in, in the UK. And I know they're looking, uh, to try to bring that to the United States as well. So I think we're going to see in that segment a lot of interest, both uh, on the northern, you know, north of our border in Canada and then down, uh, here in the U.S. with utilities as well. The, the third segment are, it, or what we would call advanced reactors. So these are non-light water reactors. Uh, X Energy, a uh, good example of that with their uh, high temperature gas reactor. Uh, Terra Power, Bill Gates' company has a has a fast reactor. Both of those were recipients of uh, the advanced reactor demonstration program and, and some significant you know, billions of dollars of funding uh, behind the, the two of those designs. And then there are others that are out there uh, in that space as well. Kairos, Terrestrial Energy, um, Kairos is a, is a pedal bed reactor with molten salt coolant. Terrestrial is a molten salt reactor. Um, Natura out of, out of Texas, which has a molten salt reactor technology they're developing. Um, so there's a number of, of those designs that are there as well. The, the final one is, is I think a little bit more of a focus on the, on the micro reactors. Brett talked a little bit about, about Oklo and, and they certainly are, are well along in that way. Um, I would also, Mentioned, and this is almost like a fifth column, uh, you know, BWXT and the military uses of reactors. We're seeing that for power purposes at the, at the facility that Brent mentioned, but there's a program called Pele, which would take uh, a micro reactor uh, that could be used internationally by the by the U.S. Army. The intention is you be able to you have to be able to load that onto a a uh, military aircraft C-17, fly it. Uh, outside of the United States, 10,000 miles and, and have it set up and be operating within 72 hours. That is a, a pretty exciting program, uh, not just merely as a means of, of avoiding a lot of fuel having to get transported to forward operating bases, but literally a means towards changing the way in which we fight wars. Uh, much higher use of, of laser-based weapons that are only enabled by nuclear technologies in other innovative ways, I think the military is looking to transform uh, our way of, of engaging with our adversaries in light of what we're, what we're learning right now in, in the Ukraine. So a lot, of, a lot of different opportunities out there in this yeah. space. No, that's very helpful because uh, we're all, um, I think, you know, there's a community of people who are, they're not nuclear people, but they are nuclear fans. 
right? Or they're nuclear proponents. And I think right. just kind of helping people understand where things go, which buckets, et cetera. C- can I ask you, Jeff, if, um, if we were determined, if, if the U.S. government and various states leaned into it, could we build, do we have the capacity to build, uh, you know, uh, 10 new nuclear plants in the next decade? Like if we, if we as a nation were determined to do that, um, is it physically possible? Um, I think it is, uh, but it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of a, of a difference from the way that we're doing it right now. Um, the plants that were built by, and, and I worked for them at one point, the Shaw Group subsequently went to, to um, Bechtel. The plants that were built for Southern Company and Vogel were massive projects. Uh, you know, at any given time, they had, you know, six or 7,000 people on the site constructing those two reactors. So it was a, it was a massive works project. As a country, we've had challenges with, with projects of that magnitude. Um, the big dig in, in, in Boston, the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York are two non-power examples that had similar issues, both in terms of time and cost. I think one of the things about this range of, of advanced reactor and, and even the small modular reactor light water technologies is that a significant portion of the work can be done in a factory-like setting. So you take as much of that out of the uh, of the stick built form as you can, but also you know these are smaller generating facilities. So um, I think there is a lot more companies that are qualified to get into that business and will be participants in getting them built. Um, I think the, the Zachary's, the Burns and Mac, the Kiewits, um, all of whom were, were not as directly involved in the deployment of the, of the larger units, but the size of the units that are being considered is something that's well within their, within their bandwidth. So I think we're going to see more companies entering this field and there will be more opportunities to build out that performance as time goes on. So Jeff, I, I mentioned in the upfront, you've, um, you were part of the nuclear uh, regulatory commission. And so I, I believe I remember my uh, history, right? You were appointed by uh, Clinton, but then uh, it was renewed by uh, George W. Bush. Um, tell us what it's like, if you don't mind, I was thinking about this. I, None of us can can understand what it's like to be inside the NRC and what's what's really going on. And I understand things are changing, but talk to us about that um, regulatory organization because I think everybody understands if all of this is going to happen, there's going to have to be some significant change or new approaches there. So. Um- you know, for the uninitiated, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the nation's sole regulator of, of nuclear power plants. Um, they have roughly around 3,000 workers, as they did when I was a commissioner, and a budget of roughly $902 billion, which is roughly what it was when I was a commissioner. It, it's gone up and gone down, but those are the, the rough sense. It's managed by five commissioners, each of whom is independently um, appointed by the president, confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve a five-year term. So every June 30th, of any given year, you have one of the five members of the commission who, whose term is is at an end and either needs to be renominated or or replaced. Um, and, by and, law, and Jeff's, and sorry to jump in, but it would be for those of us familiar, like the SEC structure or the FTC, that type of rolling. You know, the new president is just appointing. You know, as they come up. Right, and and there's a couple other things that which I think are are, are noteworthy. One. Uh, is, um, you know, it is a truly independent commission. So you're independent from the staff, you're independent from the presidency. You know, you really you really have the, the luxury, uh, and I think it is a luxury in our system, for the commissioners to, to make decisions on their own. The second thing is it's, it is uh, a, a bipartisan commission. So you can't have more than three members of either party. And typically, the party that's in power as a president, they gets to select uh, typically uh, the balance in their favor. The chairman is designated by the president. So first, you got to be a member of the commission, and then the president can make a determination whether he wants you know one person to be the chairman or, or not. Um, it's a little different than some others. You know, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, is also a five member commission, but that commission is is led um, in, a, in, a, in a stronger way by the chairman. There's m- many more authorities given to the chairman at FERC. Uh, at the NRC, the chairman's role 
uh, is really to, to serve as a spokesperson of the agency, uh, to serve if there is an emergency as the head of the agency, uh, and then also uh, to sort of manage some of the day-to-day staff issues. On the other hand, all of the commissioners at the NRC are equal when it comes to policymaking. So, uh, you know, each vote is equal. And and I think sometimes people give the chairman, uh, whoever's sitting in that seat, probably more credit than credit is, is due. I, I was fortunate to serve at a, at a, at a very positive time. We had a, a very balanced commission. Um, I served with, with the Republican chairman. I served with the Democratic chairman. Um, I was appointed by Clinton as a Republican. I was reappointed by Bush. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as I tell people when I was there, uh, there wasn't a single vote that I cast that was based on, on party, uh, on a party platform or on, on party division. So, you know, my, cl- my votes were very close to several members of the commission who were Democrats because we, th- we wanted to do the right thing. No, that's very interesting. And then from your perspective, that job, it's, it's a full time. It's full time job, and let me. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't answer part of your question, and, and part of the question is: as a commissioner, uh, you get your own staff. So I had I had seven people who worked for me, uh, several technical assistants, the chief of staff, a lawyer, a couple of executive assistants. Uh, the other commissioners get the same. The chairman typically will have about double that. Um, I also had my own travel budget, so I traveled, you know, all over the world, and I, you know, with the exception of some of the international travel, where I had to get. Um, the concurrence of the, of the chairman, um, the rest of that travel I made on my own and, and, uh, and learned a lot. So in the nine years I was at the commission, uh, I managed to get to half of the world's 440 nuclear power plants in 30 of the 31 countries that then operated them. So I, I've got probably as good an idea uh, about international programs as, as anyone. Um, and I would note, given an earlier comment I made, I, I put, took specific care um, to really learn a lot about Canada, where you are right now. Um, I've been to every major nuclear installation in Canada from, um, you know, out in, in British Columbia. Uh, well, not really British Columbia, I should say in Saskatchewan, uh, chemical facilities, which is sort of at the far end uh, of the nuclear chain, all the way out to New, New Brunswick and, and looking at uh, Point La Pro, their single unit nuclear power plant there. So maybe we could just ask, since we're on the, the international topic, I find, uh, I've heard kind of two schools of thought. One is that the NRC in the U.S. is a is the leader, or at least uh, one of the most well respected uh, regulatory bodies on the planet, and and most countries around the world, at least in the in the Western world, uh, look to the NRC for guidance and 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 almost mirror them in a way. I've heard that theory. I think the other theory that's out there is that if you want to get something done. You should go to a place like not the U.S., um, where it'll be easier, quote, easier to get done uh, from a regulatory and uh, other other standpoint. And yeah. uh, not picking on places, but you know the the observation people have is it'll just it's easier to do in some of those places. Wh- which of those two understandings do you think is right? And I might use Eastern Europe as an example. Is it just going to be easier to build a nuclear plant in Poland than it would be in the U.S.? That that sounds right. Well, there, there's elements of both that are right. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is the the, the NRC has the most um, you know articulated nuclear regulatory regime of, of any civilian regulator in, in the world, and so it has a, a you know a highly granular level of detail of, of ex- expectations. Some of those rules are, are, are well made and, and, and emulated. Uh, some of the rules that they've made more recently, I think, are not as as risk balanced as they should be. And, and I think there is a tendency, particularly more recently, of the NRC's, you know, as they say, you know, if you whittle a piece of wood too too much, end up with you don't end up with a with very much left. And and I think that's a little bit of what's going on. I think the NRC has a difficult time of knowing when to stop in law there is a requirement that the agency that the the regulatory structure the agency provides is to assure is to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public health and safety reasonable assurance was a very considered and deliberate words on the part of the u.s congress and as my former democratic colleague used to say it doesn't mean absolute protection it means you you set up a framework that provides that that assurance and then 
to quote a different commissioner, uh, David Wright, then you stop. <laughs> and and so um, I, I think that's the challenge right now. Now, again, to get back to that, that juxtaposition, you know, there are a number of regulators out there who mimic very, very closely what the NRC does. And I think generally for the sake of international, you know, protecting internationally some of these nuclear power plants, that's generally a good thing. I just think that the NRC needs to get back to being a more innovative uh, an effective regulator. And that means sometimes you've got to, you've got to learn how to turn that ratchet back, not just turn it forward. And that's the conundrum that they've got right now. So I, I guess when you think about the, um, we mentioned all the flavors uh, of, of nuclear right now. Um, as you think about the NRC, and I know you've done a lot of work with the, with the fusion uh, group, for instance, but when you think about the NRC, is it, is it the right thing to have one regulatory entity regulating, you know, uh, classic large reactors, uh, the the water and and gas, uh, you know, the flavors of SMRs, the micro fission and and fusion. Is it right to try to permit everything, all those flavors through the same body, or or, or do we get different windows that you go to? Uh, if you're, you know, depending on your flavor, like how do we, I think we all wanted to speed up the NRC anyway. And now on top of that, we have all these different flavors that are coming, which is adds complexity. How, how do you think about that? Well, I mean, there's different, you know, there's different schools of thought on that. You know, you, you, you know, do, do you tear, tear down the structure and start afresh or do you take what you have and, and, and try to fix it? And I, I'm, I'm generally more of the latter in that category. I mean, I think there's an awful lot of things that the agency does that are good. And, and so I wouldn't tear it apart in order to, to address that. I, I think an example of that right now, the, the agency is under an obligation from Congress to establish a new risk informed framework for advanced reactors. The, the current rules are, are operated under uh, 10 code of federal regulations, part 50 and 53 um, part 50 dates back you know, has its origins in, in the very early days of the of the of our nation's nuclear program, and it basically requires a two part license. First, you come in and you get a construction license, uh, you build the plant, you get a you get a, a, a operation license. You go through that process, a separate license to do that, and you go through hearings and whatnot. That process worked pretty well up until the '90s, when the anti nuclear movement really sort of went a bit berserk uh, post three mile island and 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 it, it did cause some plants to be uh to to be either shut down or threatened and growing up in New Hampshire you know I, my roots came out of uh, Seabrook station nuclear power plant which which, um, which 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 was an issue so you have the existing part 50 in the 1990s we created part 52 which was a one-step license so you would have uh, an, an authorization from the agency, you go through one hearing, and you will get a combined construction and operation license as long as you referenced a, a, an existing certified design. That was how the, the Vogel units uh, three and four, built by Georgia Power, have just started operations. Um, that process actually worked worked pr pretty well. Uh, I think there were some doubts about the ability to get through it. There was improvements that certainly could be made to it, things I wish I would have fixed when I was a commissioner. But part 50 and part 52 work pretty well. Part 53 is this new program. Uh, the agency has been drafting it. There was actually a letter that went from Congress to the agency. Uh, I mean, it went from Congress to the NRC, raising some significant concerns about the direction that was going. Just today, the agency, in a fairly bland letter, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way, um, Told Congress we're working on it. We're we'll, we'll working through our rulemaking process. Part fifty three isn't isn't working very well. Uh, it's still under commission consideration. There's still an opportunity for the commission to make significant improvements to it. But what does this all mean? I think that the agency does have the capability and has been showing the ability to regulate these new innovative designs utilizing their old processes, either under Part fifty or fifty two. And, and I think that some of the recent decisions made relative to, for example, Kairos, um, which has been going through early stages of that licensing process have been moving well. Other advanced reactors have seen, uh, have seen similar activities. So the punchline is I do think the agency can adapt to this. I think it can if it has to use existing processes to make it work. Um, Congress needs to keep 
the pr- the pressure on the agency to move faster. And that's that's going to be a, a, a really a measure of work that they're going to have to do to keep the agency in line. But I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't tear apart the the NRC to get to that outcome. Hey Jeff, I appreciate you joining us today. You know, the question I have is it seems like there's been a a lot of movement in DC just just recently. Attitudes have changed. I would have said two years ago there was zero chance anything got done, and now it seems like everyone's stumbling over each other. The thing I want to particularly talk about is just sort of the just supply chains um, for the NRC, just for SMRs or for just the large scale nuclear plants. I mean, where do you see the supply chains right now? And where do you see the momentum on just, you know, sourcing uranium from our countries and other countries? Your thoughts about that and if that is a big risk uh, to this big uh, transition? Um, I'm a I'm a big I'm a big believer in, in, in the free market. And, you know, we are a country that, after all, went from a dead stop and, and built a war machine to, to win World War II. I mean, if we have the, the, the need and if there's the interest in, 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 in buying those reactors, I do think there's a lot of folks out there that want to enter into the, into the field. And I've seen a number of companies recently start to really, you know, sniff around as to those opportunities. Now, there's some areas that we don't have that we could use. I mean, we don't do, you know, very heavy forgings in the United States. We get those from Japan or, or from South Korea, both of which, by the way, are, are good partners of ours in, in, a, in a variety of respects. But I think in terms of manufacturing the components that are necessary to go into this future fleet, I think we can, I think we can get there. Um, it is going to take a little while to ramp all of this, both in terms of the orders, but also in terms of the supply chain. But I have, I, I, I have a confidence that we can do that. Now, that's not just going to be the U.S. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, of crosswalk between Canada and the United States in that regard. On the on the uranium front, you know it's it's unfortunate um, we're in a, in a in a bit of a in a bit of a tough position because we're saying and folks in Congress are saying, well, the twenty percent of uranium that we currently get from Russia, we would like to move away from that. Um, the problem is the president just signed a, an executive order that put you know some of our most precious uranium resources near the Grand Canyon in, in a massive uh, monument status. So that is going to make it that, that road a little bit more difficult. Similarly, the state of Virginia, and I was on a on a appeal to the Supreme Court, got my name on it, you know, put away and, and said, we're not going to allow the, the use of one of the most valuable identified resources in the state of Virginia uh, that could be used for that same purpose. So we've got folks who sort of been taken out some of our U.S. assets. Now, having said that, I think there are other technologies that are out there. Uh, I think you know, Cameco, although they had they did have an announcement today that they, they've had a little bit of a setback in, in terms of resuming some of their mining operations at, at one of their sites. But that is a massive resource that that company holds uh, there in in uh, Saskatchewan. I think we'll you know they will continue to be a major supplier. We've got very reliable supplies coming. Out of Australia, a um, little bit dicey, but Kazakhstan is the world's biggest provider of uranium. Um, our relations with them have have continued to be solid. So I, I think we will be able to find the sources of uranium. Right now, the the pinch I think in these technologies is really the enrichment capability. Um, we don't have that like we used to. We used to be the world's leader, ninety plus percent uh um supplied by the US that's decades ago and no longer the case we have one operating uranium enrichment facility in in New Mexico operated by by um um uh LES which is part of Urenco um uh, but there's a number of companies i think that are right now thinking they want to get back into that business and there's certainly good reason to do so Centris for example uh is is going to be putting in a facility for the high assay the higher enrichments needed by some of these advanced reactor technologies and I think we'll see others making that move as well. So, Jeff, you know, it's, you know, because I'm mean, of course, as a person and I like, but I like you, I'm, you know, I'm going to try and tie all these things now together into one question uh, that you, you know, you mentioned, of course, the regulatory, you mentioned forgings, construction challenges. We're talking about uranium, supply chains, everything all tied together. In all of these discussions, though, a lot of we still hear, though, is beating on the drum around, you know, the regulatory challenges are going to be first. We saw these two great advanced reactor demonstration projects 
that immediately announced delays in their project after fuel sourcing issues following, you know, Ukraine war and the start of, you know, Russian aggression in Ukraine and everything. Um, so, I mean, how how do you work with your with your clients, with your customers, or how do you even talk about properly ranking or looking at, you know, where these risks fall in comparison to each other and how to pay attention to that loud, loud, loud or loudest criticism or how to not pay attention to that loudest criticism and, and focus on the real issue. So, or where is the real issue here? That's, you know, I know it's tough, but throwing it all together there. Well, it's it's a really good question, and it's a hard one to answer because I think that some of the some of the risks are going to be technology dependent. So each one of these developers of each one of these technologies is faced with a different set of challenges, and I'll, I'll try to make that a little bit more generic. But for the light water reactors, that those are technologies for which the the NRC is quite comfortable. So they they have the skill sets right now to be able to go ahead and and, and review those and make a determination. And so in those cases, I think, you know, Congress and others really need to continue to press them to do it as quickly as possible. You know, meet your ad adequate protection standard, but do it in, in, a, in an efficient and an effective way. I, I think with some of the technologies, others, the agency doesn't know as well. Uh, molten salt, I think, is, is a good example of that, where the agency will, will have a little bit more of a ramp up. They are working to, to address that. Um, and those challenges um, will, 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 you know, sort of work their way through. Some reactor vendors are using uh, high assay, low enriched uranium. There is a supply issue with that, and I think the government's putting putting efforts into that. Um, others are using traditional enrichments of uranium, so that's not going to be an issue. Um, some of them are using more exotic materials. There may be sourcing issues with some of those. Others, you know, have, have chosen different designs. So I think I think a lot of those questions are going to be answered in a, in a fact specific way. There is one thing that that isn't a challenge. You know, we talk about all the challenges out there. There's one thing that isn't a challenge. When I moved to D.C. in 1986, you know, there was probably close to a majority of folks in the U.S. Congress who were either opposed to nuclear power or were, you know, not going to push it very much. You know, this is in a post-Chernobyl circumstance. And so the, the the feeling of the country and the feeling of Congress was, was fairly anti-nuclear. And, and this was also coming off the nuclear freeze movement. There was a, an amendment that would pass Congress. It was a pro-nuclear amendment uh, and passed about a month ago before they took their summer uh, work period. And that amendment passed in the U.S. Senate um, with three votes against it. I, I can't remember the exact vote. It was like 90, 95 to three. And it was Bernie Sanders, Ed Markey, and Elizabeth Warren. Everybody else voted for it. It was a pro-nuclear amendment. That is unheard of. So, the sentiment and the support in Congress, and, and frankly, the amount of support by the American people is at an all-time high. And that's a good thing. That's something we don't have to worry about. In fact, uh, these days, you know, I, I testified in front of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. There wasn't a single member who was there. And, and it was very well attended. I had to sit in the in the in the seat for about five hours. And they were they were tripping over each other in their support of nuclear power. So that's really a big change and one that I think is very positive for for getting the support we need to make these technologies work. It, it is a pretty amazing thing. You can count on one hand uh, the number of things that have uh, that kind of agreement. Can I ask uh, both? Sorry, Jeff, you were going to say something. No, it's just shocking. I mean, I mean, pleasurably shocking. The degree of bipartisanship. And I was having a conversation with the, with the chairman and ranking member of that subcommittee, and they were both remarking about it. Boy, this isn't this great that we're able to work together and do this in a bipartisan way. Uh, and given how difficult things have been in Washington for the last eight years, that says a lot. Can I ask you both a question, uh, Brett and Jeff, just uh, unfortunately, while I'm thinking about it, not because it's the most logical next question, but there was uh, news, uh, uh, Brett mentioned the Oclo uh, of the, uh, the Air Force contract, the Indian uh, contract, uh, the Indian reactor that came online. There was also the news recently about the Fukushima releasing uh, the water uh, that is, uh, I guess, trapped in the reactors. And it's a good sign because they're going to get, I guess, turn them back on. But can you explain that event uh, to us for, you know, for lay people, if you will? 
Okay, so the, the tritium release, um, you know, in order to, in order to cool those reactors from the accident, they had to use massive amounts of of, of water. So they have something akin to, I think I, I read it, the number, Brett will probably correct me, something like 300 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water in, in these tanks. And they put them through a series of uh, filtration processes. Uh, frankly, some of those developed here in the United States, and, and we helped deploy those uh, very quickly after the accident happened. But those uh, processes are able to uh, eliminate virtually all of the radionuclides in them except tritium. And tritium is uh, is a couple of molecules away from water, and so it's very difficult to to, to dislodge those. It's also um, it has a very short half life, so the amount of time it actually stays around. I think the half life of tritium is something like fourteen years or so. And so um, the Japanese have been able to remove that material from the the water, and all, all, the only thing that remains is tritium. The issue is our ability to detect is far in excess of, of the ability to actually impact human health. And so the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, has made an independent determination assessment that the plan that the Japanese have to remove, to, to release that water, and in effect it will, will be diluted with seawater, is going to have no impact on, on, on public health and safety. And, and I have to applaud um, you know, the U.S. ambassador to Japan showed the determination. He went to a... Fukushima restaurant and ate some nice fresh sushi and said, you know, I got a lot, a lot less to worry about than, than, than this. So I, I think this is an issue which has been inappropriately um, blown up. And, and I think there's been a lot of scaremongering going around that's going to have no human health consequences, uh, according to the IEA, and certainly will not have consequences here in the United States. And that uh, ambassador, I had to look myself, but that's is that Rahm Emanuel? Is that who that Rahm is? Rahm Emanuel. Yep, that's right. Okay. Interesting. So, Jeff, maybe I was thinking about with your legal background, you know, one thing that's um, interesting is we have seen some, we do have some nuclear uh, startup companies who are choosing to finance in the public, uh, in the public markets. Um, and in a couple of instances, they're utilizing SPAC structures. But what do you think about uh, that just from a corporate finance standpoint slash um, you know, corporate structure standpoint. I mean, you, you deal with all these clients, small ones, big ones, diversified, international, domestic. Uh, do you think we're going to see more public nuclear companies? Um, I think there's, a, as, as, as you all well know, I mean, there's lots of different financial tools in the toolkit. And, and going with a SPAC is certainly one that several have, have taken that option. Um, now, <laughs> You've seen that that SPAC market as a whole um, have certain churn to it, uh, and so will that continue to be uh, uh, an option? I think the I think the jury's still on, on on that particular one. But I think that I think that what you really have seen, and you all know this one very well. I think the interest of the financial community in in taking an opportunity with some of these companies is increasing. Um, I think there is a a, a recognition. A growing recognition that in order to have the the energy transition that we're really looking for, we've got to have a variety of different technologies, and nuclear is one that really deserves a, a, a strong seat at the table. Now, the other one that's out there, and I think profiles a little bit different, is is fusion. Now, we we I'm the uh, external legal counsel for the Fusion Industry Association, and I've gotten to know uh, a number of its members. Significant amount of interest on on the part of folks out in Silicon Valley. Uh, in some of the high tech sector who invest in some of these technologies. Um, I think, you know, hopefully soon um, we're going to see, you know, the kind of changes that we've seen at, at uh, the national ignition facility uh, out at Lawrence Livermore, where they've, they've been making greater and greater achievement toward, toward uh, having more power coming out than, than going in uh, to a fusion process. I think that we're going to get plenty of shots on goal, um, whether all of the, 25 plus fusion reactor developers or members of F FIA are, are, are going to be able to be successful or not is, I think, a question mark. But it's certainly, uh, I think, going to be the case that there will be multiple uh, that will and will we'll do it in an important way. So we're going to be in a, in a period where we're going to have a, tr a group of traditional fission-based technologies. We're going to have a group of advanced 
uh, innovative uh, uh, fission-based technologies, and then we're going to have a follow-on with some of the fusion uh, fusion machines that I think will be pretty interesting going down the road. The the, the fusion community and, and Jeff, I, I, we've only I mean, you and Brad have been around it a ton, but the fusion community almost seems somewhat separate sometimes from the classic nuclear community. Maybe I have that wrong, but I think it's they really didn't like to emphasize. They almost wanted to emphasize we're a new flavor. Is, is that um, what's the connectivity across all of those uh, technologies? Well, I think the connectivity is that there are, there are folks in in government, and I would say with the U.S. National Laboratories, uh, Idaho National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab, and others, who 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 cross that di- that divide, so to speak. Uh, and and I have to be, you know, I'm I'm very mindful of, of those two groups, and they are they are separate. Um, I think. To your point, I think the fusion community um, wants to see itself being separate because their technology does provide some opportunities that you don't have with fission. You know, with fission, you have uh, uranium-based fuels. Those uranium-based fuels, after they've been in the reactor, do have long lives, and you need to be um, uh, mindful of managing that you know, over very, very long periods of time. The, the fusion devices that are out there uh, use... Uh, the, the fuel for those reactors typically for many of them will be uh, deuterium or tritium. And it does not, while, while there is some radioactive waste that is generated as a result of neutron activation, um, they don't have large, they don't have used nuclear fuel to worry about. So I think that's a, um, for both the developers of those technologies and for some of the folks who want to in, invest in them, you know, that's a very desirable attribute and one that, that uh, fission-based reactors doesn't have. Now, I think some of us, Brett would probably join me on this, uh, think that, you know, the, the challenge of using nuclear fuel is not as big as, as the anti-nuclear community would have us believe. And and I am aware of uh, several technologies uh, or developers, I should say, who are looking at trying to utilize that, that used nuclear fuel from fission-based reactors uh, and and use that uh, and, and get the ninety five percent of the energy that remains. So I think we're going to see some some interesting developments in the recycling area of using nuclear fuel over the course of the next five or ten years as well. I know one of the issues that uh, is on your mind is just the uh, uh, the safety zone around the facilities and how uh, you know by flavor that gets defined, but it's something that's being discussed now. It has a lot to do with with where we're headed. Do you want to acquaint people with that issue and give us some thoughts on that? Yeah. So just a a little bit of a history background. When I first started working in the U.S. Senate in 1986, the first issue I ever worked on was the emergency evacuation zone at Seabrook Station Nuclear Power Plant. And as part of the history lesson, uh, that was a challenge because part of that actually crossed from New Hampshire into Massachusetts. And then Governor Michael Dukakis, um, who didn't want that plant to operate, basically refused to play. And ultimately, the decision was made that the, the utility could prepare that on a, on their own. But if you have an operating nuclear reactor, and every operating nuclear reactor in the United States has a plan to evacuate everyone within a 10-mile uh, area around the plant, and that's a requirement that's been in law for many, many years, uh, it includes both involvement by the USNRC, emergency planning authorities in the individual states that are, that are involved, and a, a very important role for the federal en- for the um, for FEMA, uh, Federal Energy Management Agency. The NRC made recently, just within the, they, they announced it within the last uh, week or so, probably one of the most impactful decisions for advancing nuclear energy that has made in, and I would argue, decades. And that is, it made the determination that for some of these advanced reactor designs, they could have an emergency evacuation zone as little as a thousand, a thousand yards from the plant. And it would be sized based on the risk characteristics of that individual technology and the source term, the amount of uh, uranium that could be, uh, that's possessed there and, and the risk it presents. That's huge. So in, in, in the fifties, sixties, seventies, you couldn't put nuclear power plants in closer proximity to major cities. Put a coal plant there, which of course is re- releasing a whole lot of radionuclides, by the way, but you couldn't put a nuclear plant there. This brings with it the opportunity to repower uh, some of those existing coal sites that are closer to cities 
but still be able to utilize those nuclear technologies. So it's it's a it's a game changer. It's a really big deal, not getting a lot of attention, but I think it's going to be consequential. And where does it sit right now, Jeff, just in terms of this ruling? Is it are we done? Yeah, the, 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 the NRC commissioners have um, have voted to support it. It is now um, being implemented by the NRC uh, regulatory staff. So it's it's the policy is done. It's a good thing. And Jeff, you mentioned earlier a deal between Brookfield and its equity partners and Cameco for Westing ta- House, I guess, in 2022 for like $8 billion. And I know that took me by surprise, maybe took you by surprise, took a lot of people by surprise. Uh, maybe it's kind of an unfair question, but if, if we get permitting fast tracked and we get SMRs commercialized, who or who wouldn't surprise you is in this business in the next 10 years? Well, there's, there's a bunch of ifs in there. So, so I, I can't say I was surprised by that transaction. Um, but I, I would say, um, without divulging names, this is, this is tough. You know, when you, sometimes you know stuff and you can't talk about it. But there are some big companies out there that are, that are thinking big about how to play in this arena. Mm-hmm. And, and I would sort of, you know, to answer your question in part, I go back to history. You know, um, if you go back to the 1970s, you know, Exxon owned a, a nuclear fuel manufacturing facility. You know, Cameco was, uh, I'm sorry, not Cameco, um, Chevron, you know, owned a, a major uranium mill facility. Uh, Getty Oil uh, owned a reprocessing facility up in, up in New York. I mean, so there were a number of major oil utilities who decided to invest in nuclear because they thought it was the right way to go. Now, obviously, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl changed their minds. But I think the the risks the risks are uh, commensurately lower today, and therefore I think there are folks who are kicking the tires now, and we can see see more of that coming in. Yeah, I didn't want to say um, any major old companies' names, but that was sort of what I was thinking, or just maybe in some big industrial because it's going to be a big opportunity center. And if you're a major old company, you want to be in energy transition. This is one solution. And, and what do they do well? <laughs> they have big supply chains. They got big capital. I mean, so. Yeah, like I said, I mean, that's, that, I thought that's what you would answer, but I had to throw it out there for you. Well, and also there are, you know, there are, especially with some of the micro reactors, um, there are there are uses for those industrial facilities, including uh, major oil companies that can deploy those for some areas where it's not going to be um, it's not going to be helpful to have additional uh, carbon based generation in, in certain areas. So. Um, I, th- I think I think the thing which is most exciting about this time is just the degree of innovation that people are talking about and, and how to deploy some of these technologies. And I think that's going to be really exciting. And we haven't even talked about some of the some of the space based programs, both with uh, nuclear fuels as well as fusion, that could really uh, really change the way we do uh, interstellar uh, navigation. Well, Jeff, since you brought it up, no, I'm, but really, since you brought up earlier sort of this discussion around some of these DOD activities around nuclear also, and now you also brought up space nuclear as well, some of the activities going around, you know, there's a DARPA project around thermal propulsion, there's the fission surface power program, you know, to do reactors on the moon, there's lots of different things going Going on around habitation and propulsion, as well as around frontline military power, as you mentioned, for Pele. But we've been talking about commercial activities, permitting, all that. So where, how do these connect with each other eventually, right? And everything is the, does the, does, does the Pele have a lot of legs that really feed in to commercial or do we have to relearn everything? Can these be just the olive painted version for the, you know, military and then sort of a, a you know, a, a not, you know, the, the unpainted version for commercial? How does, how does this work in terms of sharing and growth together across some of those things that are really exciting that might be faster than some of these commercial things that are happening? But, yeah, yeah. So, really good question. So, the NRC is given the authority over, over civilian reactors. Um, DOE has its own authorities to deploy nuclear technologies and, and does so with various national labs. The Department of Defense has the ability 
uh, to <laughs> to do its own uh, review of, of some of those facilities. And and frankly, you go back to the you know we have 180 reactors that are powering all of our subs and, and aircraft carriers. Uh, that there's a program that, that probably isn't very well known where the NRC and they're going to be doing this with Paley as well has a cooperative agreement where they will go in and provide peer review. Um, um, well, they provide a peer review of those military reactor designs to give the military an additional look at the safety issues that may be coming around. And so you're going to see that with Paley. Um, I think you'll see that with, with NASA has very similar authorities. So the NRC is, is going to be learning as it goes along. And, and I don't think it's, it's going to have to reinvent the wheel when, when those types of facilities um, are, are going to come around for uh, civilian deployment. But, but just talking about Paley for a moment, I want to, I want to revisit this. Um, that reactor design was originally envisioned that it would be used to replace the transport of a lot of liquids and other materials. In Afghanistan and Iraq, about half of the casualties that we suffered were people who were accompanying the transport of large amounts of, of diesel and other, and other liquids. Um, if you can put in a Ford deployed nuclear reactor and you put one of these underground, you could get, you, you could electrify uh, large portions of the force in a way that would really benefit and, and not have, have that tie for your logistics chain. More importantly, um, if, you know, the Navy, the U.S. Navy has put in 120 kilowatt uh, laser gun, uh, laser weapons in two of its uh, four deployed ships. If you can have a nuclear reactor with an appropriate capacitor bank, that gets you up to, you, you could have a, you know, basically, um, you know, a, a one megawatt sized laser shot, which puts you at a point where you can start taking out hypersonic weapons. So what they're really looking at, especially given all of the remote vehicles that are being deployed in, in Ukraine and Russia, how do we come up with a system that can quickly eradicate that threat? And Pele is going to be a real enabler in order to be able to do that. Well, Jeff, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I hate to let you go, but, but we probably got to. Um, can can I say one last thing? Since you're in Canada, can I say one last thing that people haven't been paying attention to? A lot of people. Canada the province of Ontario has spent roughly $25 billion refurbishing all of the reactors at, at the Bruce station and at the, uh, at Pickering. And, and they've decided that, uh, you know, some of the reactors that are going to shut down at Pickering, which are older, they're going to refurbish those as well, probably an additional $10 billion of investment. So the amount of work that has been coming down to the U S the amount of engagement Massive Canadian investment. Lots of small modular reactors are, are being evaluated right now. Uh, U.S. has got a great market, but pay attention to Canada. There's a lot going on there. No, that's great. Well, where I was headed, uh, Jeff, as we wrap up, other than to thank you because this has been just a fantastic tour of so many uh, different angles on this, is we're always kind of thinking about ten years. Uh, you know, ten years as a as a horizon that you can get a lot done. It's still a, long period of time, you can get a lot done in 10 years. And, and uh, it's, of course, how, you know, corporations and big investors uh, tend to think. When you think about nuclear in 10 years, and where we might be sitting, you know, 10 years from today in nuclear, you know, any, you know, assuming we obviously we stay on this trajectory, renewed interest, renewed investment, renewed push, where might we be? How far could we get um, just what, what might the landscape look like uh, 10 years out in nuclear? Well, um, I, I'd say a couple of things. I think in, in 10 years, I think we're going to see a point at which the Chinese either come close or, or beat us in terms of the sheer amount of nuclear generation. That, that, that may be a temporary uh, situation, but they're building a lot of big plants right now. Um, India, to Brett's point, um, is going to continue to invest in nuclear. They they do have their indigenous technologies. It's a, a critically important industry to them, and I think we'll see that continue to develop. I think Eastern Europe, Poland, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, others are going to add uh, a whole lot more generation. Some of that will be large traditional size plants. Some of them will be uh, small modular reactors. I think we're going to see uh, additional countries in the Middle East, and, and Saudi Arabia is likely to be uh, the first among the, amongst them, 
um, to add nuclear generation, I would expect UAE will have uh, additional units that we're working away on as well. I think in Africa, um, I think we're going to see Kenya, Ghana, uh, potentially Nigeria, uh, and others add generation. Um, maybe South Africa will add some more to the two that they currently have. We'll see. So I think we'll see um, those kind of developments in the U.S. I think we're going to see um, several things happen. One is I think there will be a, a little bit of a bandwagon effect. I think there will be a, a group of U.S. public utilities that will jump on board and, and start ordering, uh, particularly some of these small light water reactors. Um, I think we're going to see some of the industrials um, add advanced generation uh, that could happen in the, in the, the mining arena. It could happen in the, in the steel um, chemicals and others. Uh, and I think we'll see continued development uh, in, a, in a similar way in, in, uh, in, in Canada. So I, I, I see lots and lots of opportunities. I don't think it's going to be one technology. I think it's going to be a basket of them. Um, some, some will ultimately fade away. Um, but I think, Given the myriad of potential uses for nuclear, I think we're going to see a variety of different uh, makes and models out there because because not one one, one reactor size, one reactor type isn't going to meet, be able to meet it all. Uh, that, that was awesome. Can I and I can I just ask on micro nuclear and on and on fusion? Where do you think we are with? I'm picking those because I think of them as the most cutting edge. Where, what do you think we're saying about those areas in, in 10 years? Well, I think for the purpose of, of microreactors, you know, there's a variety of, of, of those that are being developed. We talked about B2XD. We talked about Oklo. Radiant uh, is another technology out there in that regard. I think there's going to be a variety of different innovative ways in which those designs can be deployed and utilized. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a lot of clever thinking going on. And so I think there is a, a very nice, uh, bright future for them to have a, a, a strong, active, vibrant market as well. On fusion, I, I think there will be, I think there will be a, a variety of technologies that will get to a point where they will be generating electricity uh, in, in a useful way. Um, but obviously there's, there's work there yet to be done. Awesome. Well, Jeff, honestly, we knew this would be so cool and so interesting and it, exceeded our expectations. I'll speak for all of us. Just really fantastic to talk to one person who has so much visibility around so many interesting things in, in nuclear. So thank you so much. Well, it's, it's been a delight. I was reviewing some of the, uh, you know, I was listening to some of your podcasts and some of the people you've had uh, as guests. And so I'm honored to have been uh, selected among a note- noteworthy group of folks. Well, we're the lucky ones. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. All right, we'll folks. See- all right. Have a great night. Bye-bye.